I'm going to talk about abuse today, sexual and violent abuse, but I'm going to be talking about it in relation to men and men's issues. And I know this is a desperately unpopular topic to talk about. And I go into this full knowing that people will attack me for being a men's rights activist or they will use the various things that I talk about in order to attack me, as has been done previously. So I go into this knowing that the people at Your Dungeon is Suck will get a laugh out of it, and that other people will take this as some kind of indication that I am indeed a men's rights activist, or an incel, or whatever else they want to call me. I'm going to talk about this issue through the lens of things that have happened to me. Now, I am actually a rather mild-mannered person, quite able to defuse situations when they're face-to-face, and yet I've had many of these kinds of experiences. So I want to talk about them and give you the men's perspective on this. And I've called this podcast slash YouTube upload Omega Man because that's what it's like. A man who is abused or attacked and can't handle it in some way or wants to talk about it can't. They are alone. And that is a huge, huge problem. Bullying is a big one, I think, and I don't think anyone really passes through the schooling system without some experience of bullying, either being bullied or being the bully or dealing with the aftermath when a friend of theirs is bullied. At the extreme ends, this can lead to people's suicide. Now, social media postdates my school experience because I am very, very old. But even so, we saw plenty of instances of this, and I was the victim of it fairly often. At play school, one of my earliest, most vivid memories is being pushed off a slide and falling to the wooden floor by someone who wanted their go more than they wanted me not to be hurt. One of presumably many other incidents with that child, not that I remember who or what they were, (laughs) unfortunately. Primary school, I think my very first day of primary school, I experienced bullying. Uh, I was a gawky little chap, and I had a kiss curl. So I was immediately dubbed Betty Boop. And that went on for a while. I was also the kind of guy who preferred to read didn't particularly feel that engaged during playtimes and so on, Uh, was reasonably academically gifted. And, you know, that's that's a recipe for disaster in the Lord of the Flies situation around kids. Uh, My head teacher and my teacher for my last year or two of primary school uh, was a bully herself. She was extremely stern, nasty, very rarely had any good word to say for anybody, even if they were academically gifted. And we used to yearn for the days that she wasn't there and wasn't in charge. So you can get bullying not just from the other kids, but from the teachers. When it came to secondary school, I saw this happen somewhat, with sterner teachers picking on people more than they probably should have with a bad attitude and very little forgiveness. But at the time, I was just so glad that they weren't picking on me that I was fine with them picking on other people. The bullying at secondary school was a great deal more serious. There was a period of about three years in which I was tracked down and kicked in the balls quite hard at least once a week, usually twice or three times. 
This same band of bullies also hung one of my friends from a tree by his tie. And it was only through desperate effort from several of us and the intervention of a teacher that he didn't choke to death. That's how serious that sort of bullying can become. Secondary school is also where I was sexually assaulted. Uh, Some of you, when I complete the story, might think that's hyperbole, but I assure you it is not. I did feel violated, though I kind of suppressed it and didn't really emotionally deal with it until many years later. We had a swimming pool, if you can call it that, at my school. It was an outdoor one. It was solar heated, which in Britain means not heated. It was extremely cold most of the time, and very rarely was it even even remotely warm. And occasionally we would have lessons in there. And this was sometimes rotated by groups. And it was during one of these sessions uh, in the swimming pool when we'd done the exercises that were demanded of us, and we were given a little bit of free time, and it was one of the smaller groups, that a pair of girls cornered me and felt me up under the cover of the water. These were not girls that I was attracted to. These were not girls that I was in any way interested in. They were girls with what I regarded as repugnant personalities. If there was anyone I wanted to to touch me in that way, it was not them. And it was very confusing. I wasn't exactly regarded as a as a catch in secondary school. And I remember just being sort of stunned and revulsed and not really knowing what to what to say or what to do. And so I just kind of ignored it. And I didn't really tell anybody until years later, but for someone who was already awkward and unsure uh, around girls, this ramped all of that up to to 11. I became even more awkward and confused and not even particularly sure whether I, whether I really wanted female attention that much, necessarily. I'm blaming myself for what happened and yet really not feeling like I could talk to anybody because nobody would understand even though these weren't attractive girls that I was interested in you know there was this perception that I had that it would just be brushed off and indeed the reaction when I did talk about this many years later was exactly that There was another similar incident many years later. We were visiting friends and we went with them to a party. You know, a whole bunch of teenagers all together, almost through the roof. Uh, You know how it is. Um, We discovered then that if you play the swans on high-speed dubbing, it sounds like the cranberries, for example. Lots of hijinks, not any really anything to eat, a lot of weed being passed about. You, You know the kind of thing. And one of the party goers, his girlfriend, for some reason, took a shine to me. And I was sat there minding my own business, offering witty quips into the conversation <laughs> in the kitchen. Uh, when she comes over and she plonks herself on my lap and she starts grinding. And, you know, your body does what it does, whether you want it to or not. And I knew that this was someone's girlfriend. I wasn't interested. I mean, this time, she was actually fairly attractive. But even so. um, But I I froze up exactly the same way I had in the swimming pool. And I didn't really know what to do or how to deal with it or what was going on. But I did know if a guy saw me with his girlfriend grinding away on my lap and... um, trying to kiss me that there would be a fight and it would not be her (laughs) that was being hit and I really didn't want to get my face stamped in for what someone else had done to me so this was a this was a double threat really the first chance I got (laughs) 
when she got up to get another drink. I ran away and I hid upstairs just to be out of out of the way. I mean, literally hid under a, under a pile of blankets in one of the bedrooms, which unfortunately one of my friends was using as a makeout place at the time. So I'm afraid I interrupted them. But, uh, you know, safety and security before hose, as the saying goes. But that was another weird experience. And I think it brought back a lot of those feelings of oddness, weirdness, insecurity, not being able to talk to anyone. That was a bit easier to say that it was about the threat of violence than the actual sexual advance, which wasn't welcome. Yeah, It was easy to talk about it from that angle, that I don't want to get my face stomped in and that I didn't want to break the bro code by by getting off with someone else's girlfriend. It was easier to deflect it onto that rather than the real issue, which was that someone that I really didn't have any interest in was sexually assaulting me, for want of a better term. Less serious, perhaps, but also a violation of personal space... I went to art college in Salisbury and there was a lovely little arts and crafts shop that many of us would frequent when we needed to top up our supplies. And I was in there, crouched down, going through some paints, looking for some particular types that I needed. I kept thinking there was this um, weird feeling like, um, like the air was blowing across me. And... I moved up to the next row, and that one had a a mirror on it for some reason. I think it was a repurposed makeup display or something. And I saw that there was a group of um, slightly older women behind me playing with my hair, which, as you know, is is quite long. Um, I just kind of laughed it off, but it was actually quite disturbing. Imagine how you would react if... You saw a woman in a store with a gang of men behind her toying and playing with her hair without her necessarily realizing until she does. You know, no no consent, no asking, no excuse afterwards except, oh, we love your hair. Yeah, it would be it would have a much more sinister aspect then, wouldn't it? It's not something that we should laugh off just because it happens to a man. Now, is this sexual abuse? To me, it seems obvious that all of these examples are, and I'm leaving off some other stuff. Yet, this is supposed to be some kind of male fantasy, isn't it? To have the woman come on to you in some way, to touch you without your consent, necessarily, to, to demonstrate their lust for you in some way. This is meant to be the male fantasy. This is why when attractive female teachers abuse their power and position and have sex with teenage boys in their classes or whatever else the case might be that they do, lots of people will just laugh it off or pretend that the boy was lucky in some way. But that's not what it is. That's not what it's like. Perhaps one can get through by examining the whole rape fantasy thing. Now, something like, depending which which study you believe, but somewhere between 30 and 60% of women have non-consensual fantasies. Uh, Unless you're an idiot, you understand that there is a difference between fantasy and reality, and that while someone may be turned on by the fantasy of having a a pushy lover who is willing to break the bounds of social convention or class convention or whatever to give way to their carnal desires. While you can understand that while that might be an appealing fantasy to someone, hopefully you can understand that the reality is not something that people consent to. It is not something that's acceptable, even if someone has that fantasy. There's the paradoxical term in BDSM circles, consensual non-consent, where you want to play out the fantasy, but you are explicitly consenting to it. 
I think that if we take that, if we take that understanding that just because it's a fantasy doesn't mean that the reality is a good thing or a, or a desirable thing. If we take that understanding from female rape fantasies and apply it to male hot for teacher fantasies and so on, then I think perhaps we might get an inkling of understanding and sympathy going there. I've been stalked. Fortunately, not physically, but online I have had two rather persistent stalkers over the years. One of them, I think, is a man, but has quite proficient technical expertise. The emails never come from the same address. And I think uh, abusing me and stalking me has become almost a habit or a ritual for them. It started when I got a particular girlfriend back when I was younger. And shortly after we started dating, I started getting fairly explicit, nasty emails, um, all lowercase, rather creepy, threatening all kinds of things to me. And this person would also send me, weirdly, porn likes of that girlfriend. Porn stars, pornographic images that bore sometimes passing, sometimes remarkable resemblance to them. So this is probably some jealous second stringer or something, but they finally backed off, it seems. But it went on for a great many years, uh, long after we'd split up even. So I don't... It's, it's weird behavior. It's very unsettling. I have had a female stalker as well in the past. Again, online, at least I'm assuming that they're female. They have sent me all kinds of sexually explicit messages. Um, I haven't had any in a, in a while, thankfully. Um, just drastically inappropriate, especially because I was attached, then married, and this went on. It's finally kind of petered out, which is which is nice, I guess. Uh, but they would send me sexually explicit pictures of themselves, uh, minus the head, um, which makes them hard to identify. I don't; they're not anybody that I recognise or remember. The photos are all very grainy. This hasn't happened in a few years now, but this is another one of those things where. Yeah, you know, men are constantly sending uh, unsolicited dick pictures <laughs> to women, but the idea of the reverse being disturbing or upsetting is uh, laughed off. You know, um, when it takes place in this stalkerish context, it does take a much more sinister turn. Here is someone exposing themselves in their most private and intimate way to you but you don't know who they are, why they're doing it, you know, what's going on. And in a weird way, it's flattering, I suppose. And as a man, you're supposed to accept and understand and enjoy getting these images. But when you open a message in your inbox and suddenly there's a, there's a splayed fanny in your face, it's... Uh, I don't, I still don't know how to describe it. I'm trying to be as open as possible here. It's unsettling, shall we say, and leave it at that. But fortunately, that stopped. The most extreme form of this online stalking that took place, I used to have a Tumblr, uh, which was just kind of my, my private space for, for thoughts and things, really. Um, the occasional image. I never really took off on Tumblr for promoting my stuff and so on. Maybe I'll give it another go. But I wound up that Tumblr and someone seems to have somehow, this was some years ago, pounced on it and taken the same name and somehow the auto link remained. So they were making posts to what used to be my Tumblr, which they'd taken up apparently when the 
title came came open. I, I still don't really know exactly what happened. But after I deleted it, somehow it was still linked to my account and they were posting things to it. And they seemed to know a lot of rather intimate details of my life and were effectively pretending to be me. And they were then going on to say things, some of which were quite private, that they seemed to know about me somehow, or to make up things to cast me in a bad light. Eventually we realized that this was going on, and... I contacted the person behind the account and confronted them, and they pretended it was all a coincidence, nothing to be worried about. But it was just that uh, our lives eerily were very similar, um, and they eventually deleted it, and they haven't come back since. But that was a very weird incident, and that took place at the sort of height of the initial hatred for me uh, that has been going on. And that's probably the most disturbing because they knew so much about me and you have to wonder how they got that information. And when it comes to violence, you know, the threat from other men, I found a pretty good talent for avoiding that for the most part, but not completely. There was an incident at school where a guy cornered me against a wall and the only way to get away from getting a beating was to fight. Not that I won, uh, but I took my bruised, battered and, and crying body to the deputy headmaster, who was fantastically unsympathetic and blamed me for starting the fight, which was absurd. The guy was like, half again as big as me, it had a long record of trouble at the school, getting into fights and scrapes and so on. But apparently trying to defend yourself wasn't a good idea. Mostly I've avoided it. I mean, as a goth or metalhead or whatever, there were incidents of abuse hurled in the street. Um, Drive-by eggings we endured more than once people trying to start fights. Mostly I avoided a lot of that, but some people did get hit by it who were fairly close to me. You know, one guy, one poor guy, got cornered in an underpass by a gang of people and beaten up, beaten up just, for, just for being a metalhead. Yeah, it, it happens. The uh, Sophie Lancaster situation is not unusual. But by and large, for the most part, I've avoided that. There was a time last year, I was on my way to meet my friends for a gaming session, and there's a path that runs behind the train station in Reading West, which is quite dark. There's a high fence on one side, there's a high hedge on the other. Not necessarily a lot of foot traffic. And uh, a guy came at me, showed me his, his knife, told me to hand over my money, which I didn't actually have any of <laughs> at the time. And I just, I just didn't know what to do in that, in that situation. I mean, he had me cornered against the fence. And if someone hadn't come along, which caused him to, to scarper, I don't know what would have happened there because I, could, I didn't have anything to give him, nothing that would have been of any value to him. I didn't have any money debit cards were no good to no good to him uh, a backpack full of <laughs> role playing books probably not worth much to them you know so i was very fortunate there uh, otherwise i don't know what would have happened um to me he seemed like he would have been willing to to stab me to get what he wanted but i didn't have anything following that incident um I did try to order a baton or something so I could defend myself if I ever got completely cornered again, which led to a visit by the plod and a caution for trying to import an offensive weapon. Now, I'm not a big self-defense guy. I'm certainly not a gun guy. But that kind of level of response to simply trying to get a non-lethal self-defense device seems absurd. But that was quite unmanning, but I did what I normally do and suppress it all. 
Then there's what social justice type people call microaggressions. You know, the old lady crossing the street to avoid you because you're dressed in black and are wearing a long coat, heaven forfend. Or the women that get incredibly twitchy when you happen to be behind them walking at night and you're alone for whatever reason, treating any and every man as if they were an imminent threat, which they're not. I kind of understand because I get twitchy now if I'm alone and there's just a a lone young guy around, particularly if they if they uh, meet the stereotypical criteria for petty crime in the United Kingdom, which is uh, more of a class thing than a race thing here. So I understand, but I always reprimand myself, even though I've had one attempted mugging, and remind myself that it's fantastically unlikely, even, even as a man, that I'm going to be randomly assaulted by someone. And men get randomly assaulted about half again as often as women. Of course, the nature of the assault against women tends to be different, but you get my point. It's a very rare event. It happens to men more often, but it's still irrational for me to be scared. Even though I've had one attempted mugging in my entire 45 years. Now look, anecdotes are not data. I'm not giving you these insights into my life to try and persuade you that there is some massive endemic issue for men. We need statistics, we need proper data, uh, we need data with an unbiased lens, and unfortunately so much research into these areas, and beyond that into intimate partner violence and so on, is conducted by activists who have a slant. Now we can point to, in when it comes to intimate partner violence, we can point to Parity, a charity that looks into abuse of men, and they say something like 40% of the victims of intimate partner violence are men. But they're an activist group, so can we trust that statistic? The Australian government did a similar survey, and they came out with about a third, so 33%. And it all seems to be roughly in that sort of area. But do we see that same level of support? No, we, we don't. I put out these anecdotes to try and humanise it and to encourage other people to speak out about the verbal, physical and sexual abuse that they've taken, often from unexpected quarters, and how it doesn't feel good to be sexually assaulted by a woman when you're a man or to receive unsolicited nudes or whatever else the case might be, or how your heart sinks when you're just walking and some woman treats you like you're some potential rapist or, or whatever else. Yeah, it's, it's a slow, constant heartbreak, and men get no real support when it comes to these issues. That's starting to change, which is something I welcome, but there is a long, long way to go. I'm sure there'll be comments, private messages... <laughs> Uh, laughing a lot of this off and uh, telling me I'm a pussy or unmanly for, for not enjoying such and such or not standing up for myself or, or whatever, which will just illustrate the point, I think. And I wanted to do this separately without real reference to anything that happens to women because those issues also need addressing. And I don't want to disrespect those issues and those things that need addressing around stalking and violence all of it, sexual abuse, online abuse, whatever. I don't want to step on anyone else. So I wanted to create this in isolation from events as a record and as an encouragement to people to speak out and to consider, please, without dismissing everyone and anyone as an incel or an MRA or whatever else, to understand and to see that there are issues that men face, that it is unfair to treat every man as a potential rapist. That the abuse of male students by teachers or even other pupils is not something that should be taken lightly just because the victim is a man. Because this stuff is a lot more widespread than anyone really has an inkling of. But there's no help for men. Men are conditioned not to seek help. And that's as much from women as other men. 
and for us to change that requires a paradigm shift for everyone. Zhang. Music by Casket Bound.